All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. I uh, hope you guys are all doing well. For those of you guys that want to know, the family emergency is resolved. My grandfather's doing okay now that he's been treated by a doctor. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, you know, uh, feel free to come during office hours. Um, so, you know, I have issues with iLearn right now. I don't know what's going on. Um, but uh, basically, I, I went ahead and am uploading everything onto a Google Drive. I know some people are um, still requesting access for that, um, but I have made the uh, slides available, like, you know, open to everybody. So if there are students on here that um, are struggling to get on, use the link that I have attached, or it's also um, in the iLearn uh, section of everything. Um, and then students, if there's people that are coming in late and uh, need access, feel free to go ahead and re-add the link because they're not going to end up getting it. All right, uh, so today's lecture, so I don't know how many of you guys act, have actually been able to watch the, the proteins and lipids one, but um, watch it when you get a chance or at least go over the lecture slides uh, as you will be tested on that material. Um, so for the final, it's going to be this Friday. Most people that have already um, told me that they can't do Friday because of another issue with either work or um, uh, another final have already been exempt. We've already established a new time. If you have not contacted me, uh, it's too late. You have to be here for the 8 a.m. test. Uh, I gave you more than enough time to go ahead and communicate with me. Um, as for the final, it's going to be cumulative. Most of the emphasis, about 70% of the exam, is going to be on the second half of the material, so everything after the midterm. And the um, and then the first half of the class is going to be 30%. But I'm hoping that, you know, by now that, you know, we're ending the class, basically, you've been able to draw some connections between some of the first half of the material and some of the current material, um, as they are all connected in some way or form. Um, I will go ahead and release a study guide more than likely at some point tomorrow. Um, I am... Uh, going to host a review session on Thursday. It is optional. Um, I will not be recording it, so whoever wants to come can come. If you don't want to come, that's okay. Uh, I will end up recording and posting it if you guys are willing to, if I reach 80% threshold of people filling out these um, evaluations. Um, they're very important when it comes to the instructors, you know, uh, getting feedback and getting promotions and whatnot. So if you guys have enjoyed this class for the most part, have learned a lot of uh, cool and relevant things that are going to you'll be able to take with you after class, um, you know, please fill it out. I, right now we're at, um, I think only five students have filled it out. So if I can get at least 80%, then I will go ahead and record the review session. Uh, but if not, whoever is at the review session um, will be privy to what I'll be asking. Uh, somebody asked, am I going to be teaching in fall? No, I will not. Um, unfortunately, uh, hopefully in the future I am. So uh, I didn't let you guys know at the beginning because I feel like people might be a little, uh, I don't know, it's the word I'm looking for, uh, judgy or whatever, but this is actually my first time teaching. Uh, I'm currently working on a PhD in the biomed program, so um, I'm hope I'm planning on graduating in about a year, so I'm hoping to teach afterwards. Uh, so any of these evaluations will help me become a professor at UCR. I feel like we need to educate the youth, and that's what I want to do, and I feel like UCR is a great place to be able to do that. Um, so if you want to, you know, help me, you know, foster my career, then please fill this out. Um, I would greatly appreciate it. We have until the 22nd to do that, um, and thank you, everybody, who's complimenting me. Um, so let's go ahead and get started, as I don't want to waste any of you guys' time. So for our outline today, it's gonna to be relatively straightforward. We're gonna be talking about water-soluble vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins, and key minerals. Um, the water-soluble vitamins I'm gonna be highlighting are the range of vitamin Bs and uh, vitamin C. And then we need, uh, and then we're gonna also talk about the um, fat-solubles, A, D, E, and K. 
Um, and then the minerals, calcium, iron, iodide, phosphorus, and zinc. And so there are other nutrients out there or, or micronutrients, um, but these are the ones that I really want you to know as I'm going to highlight uh, key functions that they play um, within our system. And so for the learning objectives, what I really want you to be able to know is be able to identify um, and distinguish between the water and fat solubles based off their names, because you're going to see a lot of these um, vitamins, or at least on um, the ingredient section of uh, food labels, and you should be, you know, familiar with what you're putting into your body. And if some of these things are fortified with vitamins and, and minerals, then, you know, that's going to be a good thing. Um, I don't, I'm going to be going about what, how much you need to take daily. Um, I'm not going to have you memorize that stuff. You don't need to know that. You can always look that stuff up. But what I do want you to know is associate the function of each of these respective uh, vitamins and minerals that I'm going to go over. And then I'm going to emphasize deficiencies with these particular um, vitamins and minerals. So be aware of what they are. Most of the time in the United States, we're not really deficient on all these because we have easy access to uh, vitamin supplements and uh, we have access to a lot of food. It's not scarce here, but in a lot of third world countries, it's still an issue. Um, and so, you know, be aware of some of these um, deficits or deficiencies of some of these minerals and vitamins um, to be aware of like, this is how it affects other people. Uh, so I've shown you guys this slide before. This was an intro to nutrition. Um, so micronutrients is something that we need. They are not macromolecules like the carbohydrates, fats, and uh, proteins. Um, these are going to be uh, much simpler and uh, a bit smaller depending on what molecule you're looking at. Um, I'm going to emphasize the difference between the water and fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, minerals. And so I'm not going to highlight all the ones that I have listed here. The ones that I'll have highlighted are calcium, iron, and a couple of other ones that are not listed here. Um, and just be aware of how those function. So let's go ahead and first talk about the water-soluble vitamins. So water-soluble vitamins, as they imply, are water-soluble. So that means that our body can easily uptake this as we're 60 to 70 percent water. And for the most part, it's really difficult for our bodies to have any kind of toxicity against um, any of these uh, water-soluble vitamins because they're so easy to excrete out of our body. All you really have to do is drink a bunch of water and you'll end up diluting it out. Um, your body's really only going to hold on to what it needs and then get rid of everything else. Um, the main water-soluble vitamins that, and there's a few of them that you, know, you need to be aware of, are going to be the, um, vit the B vitamins or B complex. Um, and these are really essential for our health. And you're going to see when I'm going through each one of these, it, um, they're basically going to play a role in breaking down sugar for energy. And so here I have a diagram of, I've showed you this um, when it, uh, in tandem with the mitochondria, because this happens to the mitochondria. There is a pathway called the Krebs cycle that just facilitates the um, usage of sugar molecules and, you know, basically exchanges carbons throughout this cycle and um, basically generates ATP or energy from that. The vitamins are very important in this whole process. So if you are lacking vitamin Bs in your diet, you're going to lack energy. And this is the reason why you are not having an efficient process of um, the sugar. Um, vitamin Bs are also really important for nucleotide synthesis. So you guys are all familiar with nucleotides now, the A, T, uh, C, G, and uh, U. And so um, uh, here I have highlighted in blue the different kinds of vitamin Bs that are involved in these respective cycles that generate different uh, kinds of deoxynucleotides. Um, and so what I really want to emphasize is make sure you have a sufficient amount of these, especially when you're sick. Immune cells, as I showed you during clonal expansion and all that stuff, they are some of the most uh, rapidly dividing cells in the body. And so if you have a cell that is constantly uh, dividing, then that means more DNA is being synthesized so it can go ahead and split into the daughter cell. If 
there is more DNA being synthesized, and that means that there's more vitamin Bs that are being used within this cycle. So when it comes to um, being sick, you really want to give your body as much nutrients um, as possible because you want to be able to support the key um, cells that are going to help you fight off uh, any kind of infection. So we'll go ahead and go through basically, I think it's about eight of the key um, uh, B vitamins. Uh, so we'll start with vitamin B or thymine. And so um, you're going to see most of these are going to start with helps convert food into energy. And it's usually going to be by processing um, sugar or fat. Um, and so with vitamin B, you really need it to keep your skin and hair healthy. Um, but more importantly, it's really critical for nerve function. And so the daily amount that's recommended for um, uh, men and women is a little bit over one milligram. Um, and so you, we typically find these in foods that we'll eat like different kinds of fruit and different kinds of meat and rice. Um, but in places that uh, are have a scarcity of some of the, this kind of food, um, a lack of vitamin B1 is going to lead to this disease called beriberi. And basically what ends up happening is the body is deprived of vitamin B1, and this is going to lead to damage of your cardiovascular system and your nervous system, as this is a vital nutrient that plays a role in the maintenance of your blood vessels and your neurons. And so people that are um, uh, se severely deficient in vitamin B1 typically will have problems walking because their nervous system is uh, having many issues. Um, and so they'll end up using some kind of crutch to basically help stabilize themselves. They're usually also really lethargic because again, the vitamin Bs play a role in converting food into energy. And so if you're lacking this vitamin, you're not going to have energy. Uh, riboflavin or vitamin B2, again, gonna help convert food into energy. It's also needed to help with your skin, uh, hair, blood, and brain. Uh, a little, uh, the recommended daily dose is again, also a little bit over one milligram for us. Um, but the um, uh, deficiency in, in this kind of vitamin is going to be very textbook. Um, and typically people that are deficient in vitamin B2 are gonna have this thing called stomatitis. And basically stomatitis is this um, swelling and inflammation of the tongue. I'm not sure as to why this um, happens. Um, just know that this is associated with a B2 deficiency. Uh, it's also important to note that pregnant women who are deficient in B2 uh, are going to have, um, their offsprings are going to end up having some kind of a heart birth defect as this um, nutrient is really important for the development of the cardiovascular system as well. Um, like most of the B vitamins, it doesn't really have any kind of toxicity because if we have enough of it, then we'll be able to excrete it pretty easily. Um, typically, you'll find this um, uh, vitamin in milk, eggs, yogurt, basically dairy products, and um, some kinds of fruits and vegetables. Uh, niacin or vitamin B3 is going to be the next uh, key um, B vitamin. And like all the other ones, it converts food into energy. Um, most of the vitamin Bs are going to play some role in keeping your skin um, and nervous system healthy, but it also plays a role in your blood cells, usually um, both your immune and your red blood cells, as those are cells that are also really important when it comes to dividing. Um, uh, for men, it's recommended that you get 16 milligrams per day, whereas women will get, oh, it's recommended that you get 14 milligrams. Um, and this is typically going to be found in different kinds of meat um, and some kinds of vegetables, such as mushrooms, potatoes, and potatoes. Um, when it comes to this particular deficiency in, in um, vitamin B3, it's going to lead to something called pellagra, which is characterized by three Ds. So basically, it's going to be dementia, diarrhea, and dermatitis. Um, for the dementia, um, the, this nutrient is really uh, important for the nervous system. And so you know, majority, you have a lot of uh, neurons in your brain that are basically controlling 
how you think and how you move, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you're not giving your body the right nutrients, it's basically going to uh, damage some of the uh, neurons. Not too sure why diarrhea forms from this, um, but uh, dermatitis is another uh, classic textbook uh, symptom of this. And here's an example of this. And basically, this has to do with inflammation of the skin. Um, and vitamin B3, again, is really important when it comes to um, the health of your skin. And so if you're not giving your body um, the right nutrients, then it's going to end up affecting the skin. This is one of the few B vitamins, I think there's three of them in total, um, that have uh, a, a Tox, uh, toxic effect if you have too much. And it's relatively mild um, with the B vitamins. Again, you can pretty much excrete a lot of these things if you um, give yourself enough water. Um, but, you know, your liver is going to be the main detoxifier in your um, body. Uh, and then after that's going to be the kidneys. Um, and so if you have a lot of this particular vitamin, it's going to cause your liver to be inflamed because it's just too much of this particular vitamin being processed. Um, it's also, you know, important to note that this um, amino, uh, there's the amino acid tryptophan and vitamin B6 can utilize um, B or can be used to synthesize B3 if your body is lacking it. Does a uh, deficiency of B3 lead to paralysis and eczema? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I think eczema is more of an autoimmune disease. Um, so I'm not too sure on that. Um, and I'm not too familiar with um, pariasis. So I, I don't know. I could definitely look it up and uh, let you know. Um, B3 pariasis. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so vitamin B5, so this one um, is going to help convert uh, food into energy, but specifically it's going to be focused on um, using the lipids to generate that. And so um, if you watch yesterday's lecture, uh, basically when a fat is being um, broken down via a beta oxidation, that's the name of the process, um, there are some enzymes and vitamins such as B5 that facilitate that. So the um, fat molecules can be utilized for that Krebs cycle to make energy. Um, this vitamin is also going to play a role in helping to synthesize uh, neurotransmitters, uh, steroid hormones, and um, the main uh, protein that's in your red blood cells called hemoglobin. Um, the recommended amount for everybody is about five milligrams per day. Um, and the deficiency of this particular um, uh, vitamin is going to be relatively mild. The more severe it is, the more um, symptomatic it's going to be. But typically, you're going to have uh, this pins and needles feeling. And then, you know, we've all, uh, you know, sat on our hand or something that or our leg that, uh, you know, stopped blood flow. And then once the blood flow started to come back, then you got that pins and needles feeling. But this one is just a, a common symptom for this particular uh, vitamin. And here are a list of good foods that will end up uh, having um, this particular vitamin. Uh, vitamin B6 or priadoxine. Um, so it's been shown that um, in uh, therapeutic amounts, and I'm not really sure what level that is, um, can reduce the risk of heart disease. Um, and uh, it also has been shown to convert um, tryptophan into vitamin B3. It's also used to synthesize um, serotonin. So from yesterday's lecture, when I was talking about the amino acids, I highlighted tryptophan in particular uh, because it has been shown that people that are depressed tend to have a decrease of tryptophan. And so if you have a decrease of this particular amino acid, um, you're going to have reduced levels of serotonin. Tryptophan is an essential amino acid, meaning our body cannot synthesize it. We need to actually consume it. Um, and so if you don't consume it, then there's going to be less serotonin present. Um, vitamin B6 also plays a role in synthesizing your red blood cells. And so if you um, do not have enough vitamin C, or sorry, B6 present, 
um, then you're going to lead to anemia. And anemia is just going to be a um, lack of um, basically uh, iron in your blood, and, or, and it has to do with the amount of um, uh, red blood cells. And so in this particular case, you're just going to have a lot less red blood cells present because you're not having enough of this vitamin to synthesize your red blood cells. Um, again, it also plays a role in depression because this uh, molecule or this vitamin plays a role in converting tryptophan into serotonin. And again, serotonin is that neurotransmitter that's going to make you feel good. Um, this is the other um, B vitamin that does have a toxic effect. Um, typically, when you have way too much, and so this is almost 100 times more than what you need, uh, you're going to end up developing painful skin lesions. But if you end up uh, drinking enough water, you'll be able to excrete it and all will be fine. Uh, typically, like most of the other B vitamins, you're going to be able to find in your different kinds of meats and fishes and also uh, your different kinds of fruits. Um, fun fact, it's actually been shown to be involved in lucid dreaming. So if you ever actually take uh, vitamin B6, and there's a couple of different forms of it, I forget what form you need to take it in, but if you take it right before you go to bed, um, you're going to have very vivid dreams. I've actually done this before, and it's kind of crazy. Um, vitamin B7 or biotin. So this is one that, you know, I think is um, highly marketed. Um, and so this particular vitamin is also going to play a, uh, a role in converting um, your food into energy, but it also is used to synthesize glucose in the event that you um, are lacking glucose in your body. Um, then there's a couple of different pathways that I highlighted yesterday when I was, um, you know, highlighting the different um, macromolecules. Um, in some of those pathways to generate glucose, this particular vitamin is really important for that process. Um, it is also used to um, break down fatty acids. And so this is going to be the pathway that it really needs um, to generate this glucose. So fatty acids are going to be broken down. Vitamin B7 is utilizing that, and then you're going to be able to generate glucose. So it could be utilized for that Krebs cycle to generate energy. Um, most uh, I would say uh, companies will market it as uh, having biotin in their um, uh, products like their shampoo and conditioner um, and whatnot. And you know, it's because this vitamin plays a role in having you know, healthy hair and skin and as well as bones. Um, but it's a key ingredient as to why your hair and um, nails can be so shiny. And so for the recommended amount, you really want about 30 micrograms per day in your diet. So it's not a whole lot. Um, if you are deficient in this particular vitamin, um, this is going to lead to hair loss, um, brittle nails and skin issues as this is a key vitamin that is involved in maintaining the structure of all of those. Um, like most of the B vitamins, it does not have any known toxicity. Um, and you can find this again in um, mainly um, uh, your eggs and uh, different kinds of meats and uh, grains. And, you know, another fun fact, the, this uh, particular vitamin can be synthesized by your gut bacteria. So it's another reason why your gut bacteria is so good for you. It, it actually plays a role in synthesizing a couple of vitamins. There's another one I'm going to highlight in a bit. Um, but, you know, if you're giving your uh, back, good bacteria prebiotics, it's going to be able to basically utilize its own uh, biochemical machineries to generate um, this vitamin, it's going to secrete it into the intestine, and then the intestine can uh, pick it up so it can be used for um, different parts of the body. Uh, folate or vitamin B9 is going to be the next B vitamin that I want you to know. And so this one is really important for um, creating new cells. Um, and so uh, you don't need a whole lot. It's only 400 uh, micrograms, which micrograms is nothing, um, but you need that daily. And so in adults, typically this is going to lead to anemia because you aren't able to generate enough red blood cells. However, in the developing fetus, um, what ends up happening is they end up developing this um, syndrome called spina bifida. 
And if you're unfamiliar with this, um, you know, make sure if you're ever in the process of having a kid, make sure you're taking enough folate in your diet. Um, because again, this is involved in the formation of new cells. And as the fetus is developing, it's a very crucial component to the development of all those cells. And so during the developmental process, you have something called a neural tube. And that's how we actually, we start as a ball of cells. And then eventually this um, neural tube basically will end up stretching out and then things will end up branching off from it. Um, but towards the end of development, this neural tube will end up being closed. Um, but if you don't have the right nutrients, such as vitamin B9, um, this isn't going to end up closing properly. And there's a couple of different versions of spina bifida, uh, but basically uh, um, the um, baby, once it's born, is going to have disabilities for life. Um, so make sure you're taking enough of this particular B vitamin. Um, and then you're typically going to find this in uh, different kinds of grains and cereals. Usually they're fortified or that means that they're added uh, in there. Um, and then a, a couple of different uh, types of juices and vegetables. Um, I think this is the last type of vitamin B that does have some kind of toxicity to it. Um, so um, the other filtering um, uh, organ in the body, uh, aside from the liver, is the kidney. And so if you have too much of this particular vitamin B, it's going to end up causing a lot of strain on the kidney, and that's going to lead to kidney damage. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a fine balance when it comes to a lot of these vitamins. Vitamin B12, which I think is probably the most important in my opinion, um, this one plays a role in a lot of different functions in the body. Um, so it's um, mostly involved in uh, generating new cells, uh, but it's also used to break down fatty acids and amino acids when necessary to generate energy. What I really want you to pay attention to is that this particular vitamin plays a role in protecting our nerve cells. Um, and so this particular vitamin is going to help in the generation and keeping your particular neurons throughout your body healthy. Um, it's also involved in uh, generating DNA. So this is going to be one of the main key, this one and B9 are going to be the main vitamins that play a role in generating nucleotides. And again, nucleotides all make up DNA and RNA. So you need those, especially for those fast developing cells. Um, uh, the typical recommended amount for us is around 2.4 micrograms per day. Uh, and people that tend to um, be severely deficient in um, vitamin B12 are going to be anemic. And, and that has to do with the generation of, or a lack of generation of red blood cells. So here I have a blood smear of what your typical red blood cells will look like in your body. Um, here, it's kind of hard to tell from the picture, but these um, blood cells are actually a bit bigger than what they typically are. Um, and that has to do with the whole division process. Um, on top of that, um, it's been known to cause memory loss and numbness in the arms and legs because uh, again, this is a key nutrient in, the, uh, in protecting the nerve cells. So, um, every uh, neuron is wrapped around this thing called myelin. And basically it's going to act as a, an insulation to keep the electrical signals from continuing to go through um, um, and communicate with, with each neuron. Now, if you have very little um, myelin wrapped around those neurons, then you're gonna have less insulation. And so it's good. The, the, the neural connect, conductivity is going to be significantly lower. And so that's why you end up having some of these neurological deficits. Um, it's very important in the generation of uh, immune cells. And so typically what ends up happening is um, with immune cells that aren't getting enough vitamin B12, uh, especially innate immune cells, such as uh, neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils, they all have segmented um, uh, nucleases in general. There's like, they're usually about like three or four. Um, but when you're uh, vitamin B12 deficient, typically you're going to end up being hyper segmented or you're going to have a lot of these. Um, the, basically, the nuclei is going to be broken up into a lot more fragments than the typical two to three that um, a neutrophil will typically have. 
Um, this one has no known um, uh, effects or toxicity. So you can basically have lots of quantities in it. It's also important to note that there's some people that struggle to absorb vitamin B12. So when we end up uh, eating it, basically it's going to make it to our intestines and in order for us to absorb this particular vitamin B, um, there are, there's a carrier protein that um, is involved with uh, transporting the vitamin B12 to the respective areas in the body. Um, some people will end up having a deficit um, of some of those carrier proteins. Um, and so that's gonna be, that's gonna make them less efficient at absorption. Um, and, but you also have some of these carrot proteins already naturally in the blood. And so um, one way that people can get around um, vitamin B12 deficiency is by taking it sublingual. And so we have capillaries under our tongue um, that is basically a, a, a direct route to um, our cardiovascular system. And so if you see any of the vitamin Bs, most of them can be put under the tongue um, because they're water soluble for one, and two, they have the right proteins to basically carry them throughout the body so you can have um, the maximal amount of absorption. Uh, most of the time, you're going to find vitamin B12 in different kinds of uh, meat and dairy products, and then a lot of the time, the food industry will fortify um, different cereals and grains um, with um, this particular vitamin. So the last water soluble vitamin that uh, you need to know is vitamin C. So we hear about it all the time. So what does it actually do? We always hear it's good for us, but I don't know how many people actually know what it does until today. Uh, so basically when it comes to the synthesis of this molecule called collagen, so collagen is gonna be the molecule that keeps us looking young and um, keeping cells looking plump. Um, usually we become less efficient at making collagen and that's one of the reasons why um, we age. Um, uh, but in the synthesis of collagen, we need vitamin C. So here we have a fibroblast that synthesizes collagen. Um, but in order to do that, vitamin C and some enzymes basically will end up working together to synthesize a collagen molecule. Um, and so people that are deficient in um, vitamin C will end up de developing this um, disease called scurvy. And we learned about scurvy, um, I guess the most uh, recent history from it are uh, sailors that were out at sea for uh, many months on end. So we get vitamin C, you know, as they always tell us from our fruits and vegetables. And so typically these are going to spoil really quick on the ship. And back in the day, it would take, what, months before they actually saw land. And so what ended up happening is they were lacking vitamin C um, in their diet. So that ended up, um, they ended up becoming deficient. And so if you're deficient in that, then you can't make collagen. And so if you can't make collagen, then basically there's going to be a lot of issues with your uh, skin. And so a lot of these people, oops, will develop um, basically loose teeth their eyes will end up being sunken and their, their skin's gonna look very unhealthy. It's gonna be very pale. Um, and that's just because of this whole synthesis process. Um, the uh, vitamin C also acts as an antioxidant. So if you look at the structure of it, it can basically bind to free radicals um, to uh, neutralize them. So the free radicals don't damage the DNA. Um, the typical amount of uh, recommended amount of vitamin uh, C is going to be 90 milligrams for men and 75 for women. Um, they, it's also recommended that smokers, uh, if you're you know, male or female, will add 35 milligrams to this. And the reason why is you know, when you're smoking, you're creating carcinogens or, or and the, those carcinogens are mainly free radicals. Uh, when you burn stuff, it's a, usually in a very inefficient process. So you're going to end up um, developing a lot of oxygen species that um, don't have their outer shell of electrons filled so that those electrons are going to want to bind to something. And so that's one of the reasons why um, smoking is going to end up leading to cancer because it's going to end up, those free radicals are going to end up binding and damaging the DNA. And so vitamin C plays a role at neutralizing those um, 
particular uh, free radicals, and that can help reduce your chances of cancer. Um, you have to have a lot of vitamin C before you start to experience toxicity. So, you know, we have 2000 milligrams versus uh, 90 milligrams. So that's uh, a significant difference. Um, and, but the, because it is a water soluble vitamin, um, the, um, to get rid of it is basically uh, very mild. It's just diarrhea. And that's because the body's trying to excrete it out. Um, but the vitamin C has a different role that, uh, you know, they're always telling us that it's good for our immune system, but how? I, I've heard this for so many times, but, I, you know, most people aren't aware of how it's actually good. And so studies have shown that um, both your innate and adaptive immune cells, so you should be familiar with a lot of these already, you know, BT cells, neutrophils, and macrophages, I don't know why that's MQ. Um, I didn't talk about natural killer cells, but anyways. Uh, but these immune cells have um, vitamin C transporters, so they can transport the vitamin C into them, but they also have vitamin C receptors. And so receptors are going to lead to some kind of signaling cascade. And so this is going to make the cells much better at what they do. And so here they have a list of different kinds of functions that vitamin C has once it's either uptangent or the receptor is stimulated. Um, <clears throat> but in general, it's going to make them better at what they do. So if the main function of a macrophage is to phagocytose um, things, then it's just gonna make it better at doing that. It's also gonna play a, a big role in both B and T cell proliferation during that uh, clonal expansion um, uh, part of when they're recognizing the uh, antigen of interest. Um, and then it's going to help them with their effector function where B cells are going to be able to secrete antibody. And then the respective different kinds of T cells are going to be able to do whatever they do. So either it's going to kill or um, so CD8 T cells, or it's going to help educate or direct the other immune cells. Um, and those are going to be your CD4s. Somebody asked, is it the antioxidants of vitamin C that eliminate the free radicals? So, uh, yes. Yeah, so vitamin C itself is an antioxidant. So vitamin C doesn't have antioxidants in it. It itself is an antioxidant. And um, basically, this is going to bind to the free radical. And if the free radical no longer um, needs to bind to something, it's neutralized. So um, that is going to prevent it from interacting with um, things such as your DNA. So now we can talk about our fat soluble vitamins. Uh, so unlike water soluble vitamins, which you know I've already said are easily excreted because we're mainly water, and once the body has enough of it, they can just you know we can easily just pee it out. Um, Fat soluble vitamins tend to stay in the body for longer periods time, of time. So it's typically harder to actually be deficient in these if you're having um, enough in your diet, uh, because typically they're going to be stored um, in uh, either your liver um, or in your fat cells. Um, and so when we um, end up eating um, these vitamins or fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, um, they're going to be absorbed in the same process as fatty acids, which was from yesterday's lecture. So, you know, remember, be aware what are those two steps that are needed um, to absorb fatty acids through the intestine. So the first vitamin I want to highlight is vitamin A. And there are two forms of this vitamin. There is retinoids and carotenes. And so retinoids are going to be the precursors to the light sensing molecule in our eyes called rhodopsin. And so here I have a nice diagram of how this works. Basically, in order for us to uh, sense light, um, we have these photoreceptors in the back of our eyes called rods and cones. And so I believe it's the rods that have rhodopsin on them. And so once light ends up hitting the rhodopsin, um, that's going to transmit a signal that we're, at, we're able to see something. Uh, but the light basically will end up causing this particular uh, molecule to degrade. And so um, in order to basically resynthesize it, um, your body needs retinoids to do this. 
And so that's why they say vitamin A is good for your eyes. It's not that you're going to have better vision, like in terms of like depth and perception, it's going to be more you um, can process light much easier. Um, and so people that are deficient in vitamin A will end up uh, leading to night blindness. Um, and so, you know, have you, if you guys have ever been in a well-lit room and it's nighttime and then you shut off the light and then, you know, you're blind for a couple of seconds, um, it's because this whole process is occurring where it's trying to replenish some of that rhodopsin so it can utilize any light that's present um, to go ahead and see. Um, but if you're lacking this vitamin, you, um, it takes your eyes a lot longer to adjust. And if you're severely deficient, your eyes never really adjust. Um, and it wasn't until I think a few decades ago that we realized that this was actually a thing. Um, carotenoids are the other kind of, uh, vitamin A, and these are going to function as antioxidants. So again, an antioxidant is going to bind to free radicals that, um, basically neutralize them so they can't bind to DNA and lead to DNA damage. Um, the sources of the different kinds of vitamin A's, um, are going to be, um, uh, from two different sources. So from the retinoids, uh, they're typically going to be from uh, meat and um, animal products, um, whereas the carotenes are going to be from your uh, vegetables and fruits. And so the um, way that you can identify carotenes in your food is it's going to give it that nice orangey and yellow color. So if you're looking at like bell peppers and your pumpkins and carrots, um, these are really high in uh, carotene. And when you uh, consume these kinds of um, uh, antioxidants, um, it's going to help uh, lower your risk of different kinds of cancers. And there's been studies that have shown that if you have high intake, let's say if you're a smoker and you uh, eat uh, carotenoids, um, then you're going to end up reducing your chances of cancer. But um, I'm not going to show this because, you know, it's more information that you need to know. But just, you know, to add on to that, there was a different study that was done where they gave smokers um, capsules of just pure uh, carotene. And when they were doing the study for, uh, I forget how many years, they noticed that there was an increase of um, people that were developing cancer when they were smoking and taking the purified form. So it's this, you know, I want to emphasize the point. It's really important to be getting it from the natural sources rather than just pure supplementation. Um, supplements can be good, um, but you can't rely on it. You need to be getting it from your diet as I'm sure you've seen or hopefully you've you know, made some connections that a lot of these same foods that I've had here um, also have other kinds of nutrients that are really important for our health. Um, vitamin D is the next fat soluble vitamin. And so um, there's two forms of, the, um, of this particular vitamin, there's, uh, D2 and D3. Um, D2 needs to be converted to D3 and D3 needs to be converted to an active form in order for our body to actually utilize it. Um, and so there's a whole enzymatic process that happens within us um, that does that. Um, the One of the ways that this is able to do that is through um, UV light. So we only have the vitamin D3 version in our skin. And so once vitamin uh, D3 interacts with UV light, um, this will change its shape where it converts it to its active form. And once it's in its active form, then it can actually be used for um, its function. And its main function is going to regulate the amount of calcium um, and phosphorus that our body is able to absorb from the intestine and kidney. And so that's why if you ever see uh, supplements that have both calcium and vitamin D, it's for this process. Because if you're lacking vitamin D, then you're not going to be able to absorb the calcium and phosphorus very well. Uh, and so people that are severely deficient in vitamin D will end up developing this thing called rickets. And basically their bone development isn't very good. And they typically will be a characteristic of this um, uh, bow-leggedness. 
um, versus, you know, your normal or straight, you have more of a, a bend to them. Uh, so, you know, be, be aware that this is um, a, a textbook, uh, classic example of vitamin D deficiency. Um, there, there is a limit of toxicity um, for this particular vitamin, but it's very rare for this to actually happen just because there are a few steps that the body needs to go through in order to make this vitamin um, uh, 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 active. So, uh, so it's a very rare phenomenon that ever happens. When it comes to the sources of these two forms of vitamin D, um, your vitamin D2 is mainly going to be from your plant sources, whereas your vitamin three is gonna be mainly from your animal sources. Um, so just be aware of those two differences. Um, yep, that's everything I'm gonna say. Uh, the next vitamin, uh, uh, fat soluble vitamin I want to talk about is another good antioxidant called vitamin E. Um, and so here I have an example of what typical reactive oxygen species look like. So um, this is oxygen in its normal form. Now, what ends up happening is when it's um, imbalanced, such as these little dots that we see here in red, um, it, these red dots basically want to bind to things to make it look like this kind of oxygen. Um, and so basically what uh, antioxidants will do, such as vitamin E, is they'll end up basically filling in this electron um, so it's happy. And so once it's happy, it usually will end up taking a form that's similar to this, so it doesn't end up interacting with us. Um, it's really important for protecting and preventing Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this has to do with how Alzheimer's is able to manifest. And so you'll learn that a lot of different um, neurological diseases, um, they, they do have a genetic component to them, but most of them are multifactorial. And what we're learning is our environment is having the most, uh, having the biggest effect on how some of our uh, how some of these neurodegeneration uh, diseases are manifesting, and Alzheimer's is one of those where uh, we're seeing that pollutants in the air, which some of them are um, uh, reactive oxygen species or other kinds of um, uh, free radicals, uh, are getting into the brain and basically misfolding protein and damaging it. And once, once those proteins are misfolded, um, you're gonna end up forming these different kinds of aggregates that are going to, one, cause inflammation because your body's trying to clear it. And usually that's gonna be um, the resident macrophage called microglia or other immune cells that are recruited. Um, but then it's also gonna uh, inhibit the neural conductivity. So every neuron is connected to some other neuron and that and they facilitate communication. So if you have protein in the way of that, it's going to end up uh, damaging um, some of that connect conductivity. Um, it's recommended that we get about 15 milligrams in our diet. Um, and we typically find these um, in the healthy fats, such as uh, olive oil, flaxseed oil, and all the other kinds of vegetable oils. Um, and uh, if people that are typically really deficient in this, they're gonna be very sensitive to uh, reactive oxygen species. So what ends up happening is that they don't have this uh, antioxidant present because they have such low amounts in their body, their red blood cells are going to be more susceptible to being killed by these reactive oxygen species. So if these reactive ox oxygen species uh, bind to the red blood cells, they're basically gonna end up bursting open and then that's gonna end up leading to anemia because you need these red blood cells to help facilitate the transport of iron and oxygen to the rest of the body. Um, the last key uh, uh, fat soluble vitamin is vitamin K. Um, and so the main function of vitamin K is going to facilitate the activation of enzymes that are involved in blood clotting. And so typically, you know, when we cut ourselves, um, we only bleed for not very long. And that has to do with blood, blood clotting factors. And so once the body recognizes that there's an injury um, present, then basically there's this whole signaling cascade 
that ends up occurring um, to generate blood clots so you can basically fill in that gap and allow it to heal. Well, vitamin K is really important in facilitating that process. And so if you do not have vitamin K present, then it's not going to be able to activate one of those key enzymes that uh, facilitates some of that signaling. And so if you're not able to do that, then basically it's going to take a lot longer for your um, bleeding to stop because you're not able to form those blood clots. So usually you'll end up having some kind of excessive bleeding. Uh, eventually, you know, hopefully um, you'll be able to have some vitamin K in you for it to start to stop. Um, but another source of vitamin K other than through the diet is again, your intestinal bacteria. This is why, you know, I've emphasized it multiple times. They do so many good things for our body. And one of them is to synthesize vitamin K. So if you're giving your bacteria prebiotics, they're able to synthesize vitamin K and then vitamin K is going to be able to use, be utilized for this pathway. And interestingly, um, it accounts for the amount, a uh, 50% of your vitamin K that is required by the body. So, you know, really keep them happy. Um, there are some people that will take anticoagulants. So basically this uh, slows down the process of blood clotting and there's a whole, you know, signaling cascade that's involved in that. Um, but some of that ends up inhibiting some of this pathway. Um, so if you're ever taking any kind of anticoagulant, you really want to make sure your vitamin K is um, increased uh, because the anticoagulant is only going to be able to stop some of the blood clotting from occurring. It's not going to be able to do everything um, unless you have tons of it, which some of it can be toxic. Um, but uh, anticoagulants can be a good thing when you know, you're at risk of uh, a stroke or some kind of blood clot. Um, but in general, you really don't want them because you're going, if you ever get cut, then it's going to basically slow down the process of clotting factors, which is going to lead to excessive bleeding. Uh, man, food really is just as pushing building blocks into it. Yep. Uh, okay, now let's talk about the last um, kinds of nutrients called minerals. Um, so, you know, be aware of all the minerals that uh, I'm going to highlight. There are some other ones that I'm not going to talk about, um, but these are going to be key ones that some of them are interconnected with each other. So that's why I want you to be familiar with them. So I've already talked about vitamin D that is important for the absorption of phosphorus and calcium. And so once you have enough vitamin D present, then you're going to be able to absorb calcium much more efficiently. And so calcium is going to be the main mineral that makes up your bones. And so um, if you were to ever take any kind of other uh, biology class, you're going to learn that calcium is one of the main um, uh, ions or minerals that your cells use to communicate with each other. Um, and so one of those functions is through our movement of muscles. And so there's this whole process of when your muscles are at, are at a resting state, um, you know, there's certain proteins that kind of hold that together. But when you're moving those muscles, basically within your muscle cells, um, there's a, a, a high release of calcium um, that ends up occurring that allows for the uh, contraction and relaxation of the muscles. So, you know, make sure you're getting enough calcium in your diet. Um, typically, uh, for people that are around 31 and 50, you want about 100 milligrams, uh, sorry, 1,000 milligrams uh, of uh, uh, calcium. When you're much older, you're going to be wanting to increase this along with um, vitamin D, again, because that's going to increase the absorption. Um, People that are significantly deficient in calcium will end up uh, decreasing the amount of calcium that's bound to their bone. And this is going to lead to osteoporosis. So there's a typical level of calcium that's in your blood. Um, and once that goes below baseline, what your body ends up doing is it starts breaking up some of your um, bone and releasing some of that calcium back into the blood so it maintains that base level. And so if you are de deficient in calcium, then that's going to cause um, demineralization of your bones, and that's going to lead to osteoporosis. 
Um, for people that are over 50, um, they typically, especially women, um, they end up developing osteoporosis um, because uh, there's hormones involved in it, but it's also due to um, our body just become less efficient at absorbing all of this and actually being able to utilize it for um, the generation of new bones. Uh, so make sure you know you're combining those two together. Uh, there's going to be a variety of uh, places you can get this in your diet. Yogurt is going to be a good place. A lot of other uh, dairy products and uh, your uh, vegetables. Um, when we consume calcium, our body doesn't consume 100% of it or doesn't absorb 100% of it. Um, it really um, only absorbed roughly about 30%. Um, and so you don't need, so you, this, this seems like a lot, but we, we consume enough calcium in our diet um, where most people, at least in this country, um, aren't super deficient. Uh, but again, when you're older, that's going to play a role in osteoporosis if you're not getting enough. Uh, iron is going to be another key mineral that you want to be aware of. So um, <clears throat> iron is basically going to help facilitate the transfer of oxygen to the rest of your body. And so when we look at a red blood cell close up, it's composed of these different um, proteins called hemoglobin. And so within the hemoglobin, you have these things called heme groups. And attached to those heme groups, um, these little red dots that you see, is going to be the iron molecules. And so when we inhale, the oxygen is basically going to bind to the red blood cells once it crosses you know, the, the cells that make up our lungs, the alveoli. Um, and once the oxygen makes it into the blood, it's going to end up coming into the red blood cells where it'll end up binding and holding on to the iron until it's released at different parts of the body. And so people that um, develop anemia, most of the time it's because of an iron deficiency. They're not getting enough iron in their blood. And so if you're not getting enough iron in your blood, then you're not having enough iron that is on your red blood cells. Um, and that's going to reduce the amount of oxygen that you're able to shuttle through the rest of your body. Um, just like um, the other mineral, we don't absorb all of the iron when we eat it. Um, our body only absorbs about 10% of what we consume. Um, so, you know, you really want to be conscious of uh, the amount of iron that you are uptaking. Uh, there is a toxicity with iron, um, but for the most part, um, people don't end up developing any of this toxicity just because we utilize the iron all the time. Um, when we look at the uh, sources of um, iron in our diet, there are basically two forms that you need to be aware of. There's the Fe2 positive, and the Fe3 positive. So this Fe is, you know, the chemical um, formula on the periodic table for iron. So it's for ferrous. Um, and then this has to do with the charge that's on it. So it's a, a positive two charge and a positive three charge. When we consume the uh, positive two charge, um, we typically are going to get this from animal products. Um, and this is the form that our body wants when it comes to um, basically shuttling it to different parts of the body. Um, the other form is going to be from plants. And so plants like spinach will have uh, high amounts of uh, this form of the iron, but it takes our, our body time to actually convert um, this version of iron to the uh, plus two charge. And so that's why when we consume, if we were to consume both the plants and the meat at the same time, our body's readily going to absorb the source from the meat because it's in the form that our body can readily um, absorb. Um, our, there's enzymes that we have on the surface of our uh, intestinal cells, again called enterocytes. And those enzymes are basically going to be able to convert the three plus charge of iron to um, the plus two charge. Once that's converted, then we're able to uptake this um, into our body and then it can get shuttled to wherever it needs to go. Iodide is going to be another key mineral that we need to have in our diet. 
it is very, very important when it comes to the synthesizing of thyroid hormones. So thyroid hormones basically are some of the key hormones that regulate the endocrine system. So that's going to be, you know, everything that facilitates, uh, you know, how our body temperature is regulated, how we utilize energy and, and whatnot. Um, now, uh, basically the process goes is when we intake uh, iodide, um, the iodide is going to be uptaken um, uh, by transporters. And so this here we have is a, um, uh, your thyroid. So this is somewhere in the middle of your neck. And uh, the iodine is going to be taken out from the blood, transported into the cell. And then the cell is going to transport it out into this region where your uh, thyroid hormones are synthesized. Once the um, iodine makes it there, what's, what's going to end up happening is this process called iodination, where the thyroid hormones are going to uh, have iodine attached all, all on it. Once the iodide is attached to it, it's basically going to be able to excrete it out into the uh, main uh, structural cell that can export it into the blood so it can go and do its uh, respective signaling and respective functions. Now, people that are deficient in iodide um, will end up um, developing these things called goiters. And the reason for this happening is if you're not having enough iodide in your diet, then these hormones can't be uh, iodinated. And so if they're not iodinated, then they can't be exported out into the blood so it can do its function. And so what the body ends up doing is trying to overcompensate by generating more thyroid hormone. But again, because this thyroid hormone is being generated, but you can't add iodine to it, it can't be excreted. So basically this tissue ends up becoming really enlarged. Uh, and then this ends up developing into this goiter. Um, so be aware of this iodide being really associated with goiters. Um, they are very preventable if you um, consume enough iodide in your diet, which is only 150 micrograms per day. Um, a lot of countries uh, have done, uh, or they've added uh, like different kinds of salts um, or different iodides to salts, such as you'll see on your um, packaging, I iodinized salt, um, and that's to continue to have a sufficient amount of iodine in your um, diet. Uh, I think that's everything for this one. Okay, phosphorus is going to be the other key nutrient that goes along with um, your calcium and vitamin D. So those, those three work together, but there's a fine balance. Um, and so with phosphorus itself, um, its main function is going to help protect bones and your teeth. Um, and you can see here, the composition of our bones is mainly calcium and phosphorus. Um, phosphorus is also used as part of the building blocks of DNA and RNA as well as part of the phospholipids, but it's usually in the form of phosphate. It's not just a phosphorus molecule by itself. It usually has some oxygen attached to it. So if you go back and revisit any lectures that I talked about the DNA and RNA structure or the structure of phospholipids, you're going to see these phosphate groups um, attached to the respective molecules. Um, and that's the, the source of that is phosphorus from your diet. Um, there's going to be a wide variety of foods that you're able to consume to make sure you have sufficient amount of uh, phosphorus in your diet. And this is mainly going to be from your vegetables and a couple of different kinds of meats and other dairy products. Um, what ends up happening, though, if you're not getting enough phosphorus in your diet, is you're going to end up developing fragile bones. Um, and because phosphorus plays a role in regulating the amount of calcium along with vitamin D on how much is absorbed and how much is kept in the blood. And so this is one of those minerals where you can have too much in your body. If you have um, too much phosphorus in your body, um, basically what's going to end up happening is it's going to end up telling the body you need 
more calcium in your blood to help balance the phosphorus out. So it's going to end up increasing that calcium in the blood by demineralizing the calcium that's found in your bones. And so if you're demineralizing this to counteract the amount of high levels of phosphorus in the blood, you're going to end up making your bones very weak. So this is a very fine balance with how much you should be taking, and that's typically going to be around 700 milligrams per day. Um, there's also some drugs, and I'm, I would need to look up which drugs those are, um, are able to inhibit uh, phosphorus. So if that ends up happening, then it basically inhibits this whole process, and it's going to make your bones weak. So just be aware of that. Uh, the last mineral that I want to talk about and emphasize is zinc. Um, and so zinc is going to be a key mineral that uh, functions as something called a cofactor. And so a lot of enzymes require cofactors. And all they are, they're usually some kind of mineral like this. Usually it's either zinc or magnesium where they end up binding to a certain region of the enzyme and it the enzyme ends up changing its shape. Once the enzyme changes its shape, it usually puts it into its active form. Um, and that's typically what will happen in us. And so that's one of the main functions of zinc in our body. Uh, it also plays a role in releasing vitamin A from the liver. That's typically where vitamin A is stored if we're ever deficient in vitamin A. Um, the thing that I really want to highlight though with zinc is it inhibits specific viral replication enzymes. So here we have a nice diagram of the whole process of how uh, you know, viruses are able to get into the cell and hijack the host cell machinery so they can go ahead and, and export. And here are a couple of key viruses that basically zinc is able to bind to the respective viral enzymes that play a role in the replication process. Uh, and it inhibits the function of those enzymes. So it basically has the opposite effect of, um, of our enzymes. So when the zinc binds to our enzymes, uh, it's gonna make them more active, but if it ends up binding to viral enzymes, it's going to end up inhibiting them. Uh, and so if you end up inhibiting them, then they're not gonna be able to replicate very well. Um, and so that's why a lot of different kinds of drugs on the market, like Theraflu, will have high amounts of zinc in it, and it's to help slow down the viral replication process. Um, and uh, also, in, and on top of that, if you're deficient in this particular um, uh, mineral, you're not only more susceptible to uh, viral infections, but you're also going to delay your wound healing, and this is also going to lead to abnormal hair loss, as zinc is really important in some of the enzymes that are that facilitate these, um, the process of wound healing and making hair. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a level of toxicity, and I don't remember what the um, what causes, whether the symptoms of toxicity, um, but typically the areas, the, the kinds of food that are typically going to be high in zinc are going to be your red meats. Remember, just eat those in moderation, um, your chicken, uh, and a couple of different uh, seafoods. Um, in order for us not to be deficient, uh, food companies have also added zinc to our um, some of our cereals that we eat. Um, with that, I will take any questions. Um, I will go ahead and add the, um, uh, the link to uh, the chat.